this is uh, perhaps the third or fourth time that Aima has invited me to speak and uh, I don't know why they call me again but uh, I'll tell you why I like coming here. Well, first of all because Rekha is wonderful and then Shiv and Gautam and Sanjeev and the others, you're all very nice, very warm and welcoming. But most of all, and I say this from my heart, I find that this is the best audience to be with. I mean, there's always so much energy in this room. You know, there's always something happening and the uh, audience is very calm, the speaker is tense. So that is uh, never a problem here. Uh, you were a little rowdy yesterday in the last session, but that's okay. <clears throat> the theme of the conference is uh, courage in uncertainty. And uh, when I was given the executive summary, uh, this is what it said. Facing the future and uncertainty with courage is not a way, but the only way. This is what I received from Aima. Well, that in itself is not new. Aristotle said centuries ago that courage is the first of all virtues because without it, we cannot act on any other virtue. So this has been acknowledged a long time back. But let me also share with you what a very well-known doctor said a long time back, a very famous doctor, Michael Boyd. He said, all that which is powerful for good is potent for evil. It's good to diet, but it's not good to diet too much. It's good to exercise, it's not good to exercise too much. It's good to work, it's not good to work too much. So all that is powerful for good is powerful for evil. So courage, I think, is powerful for good, but courage can also be very potent for evil. And that is why my presentation starts with a question. Courage is uncertainty. What I mean to convey is this. There is a lot of the uncertainty that we find ourselves in, self-inflicted, brought upon us by ourselves because we are being too courageous perhaps foolhardy. So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is, as much as Sharuk said to all of us yesterday, he's here less to talk about success and more about failure in the context of success. I'm here to share with you some thoughts to tell you less about what to do in my view, in my humble view, and more about perhaps what not to do, as I have learned from my own experience. Next, please. What this slide tells us is that as per a study done by Ernst and Young, quoted out of a book called The Origin of Brands by a very well-known marketing strategist, Al Dries, 90% of all new products and services introduced worldwide fail. Now, you would not believe in a minister who failed 90% of the time. You would not send your children to a school whose students fail 90% of the time. You would not fly here on an airline that didn't take off or land properly 90% of the time. But as managers, we think it is our birthright to be wrong 90% of the time. So this is a statistic. And if you think that this is just a uh, isolated statistic from a consultant's book, then let me take you on to my next slide. This comes from the Harvard Business Review about two years back, April 2011. There was an article there, and if you read it, you will find that it pretty much says what Mr. Rees said, what Ernst and Young said. Except that they say we don't fail 95% of the time, we fail only 75% of the time. So that is some consolation. There's a, there's a positive side to this. We are part of an industry or an activity where people fail 90% of the time. So if we fail only 80% of the time, we do better than everyone else. <clears throat> the reason I title this slide as culprit is because sometimes I think this is a wonderful self-sustaining model. You go to places like Harvard Business School, they teach you some stuff, then you go and manage companies, 
you fail 90% of the time, then you have to unlearn and go back to Harvard Business School so they can teach you some more stuff. So it keeps their business going quite nicely as business schools and, and business consultants. I have in my own experience at Bajaj since 1990 been a victim of many such theories or teachings or gyans as we call it. I want to share some of it with you in my next slide, please. When I finished engineering from the UK, I essentially studied world-class manufacturing. The best known author at that time or the expert of the subject was Richard Schoenberger. By the time I joined Bajaj, a few months later, the concept had already changed from world-class manufacturing to just-in-time. Everybody was talking about just-in-time, just-in-time, just-in-time. So I got to work on the assembly line that used to make scooters there, trying to implement just-in-time as I understood it, but I was not able to. Because by that time, somebody told me just-in-time is passe, you have to now talk about core competence. <laughs> so I bought a few books on core competence and I took up studying core competence. But then there was a quality movement. So Kaizen ho gaya, QFD ho gaya, QFD se TQM bhi ho gaya. So once again, I was a student. I am not able to get out of studying mode. So how can I practice? So I was studying QFD and TQM. And then MIT came up with lean. And I thought if this is MIT, then that's the ultimate. So then I, I turned my attention to lean, but it was uh, hijacked by CAD CAM, automation and robotics, and of course then finally by Six Sigma, which was so complicated because it was so statistical and, and you go through it with blue belts and black belts and green belts and all that kind of stuff. And then there were some really esoteric concepts like uh, managers need to go into blue oceans wearing seven new hats with seven new habits and, and stuff like that. I mean, it got really complicated. So, you know, in 20 years, I have been through 20, 30, 40 different uh, theories uh, and, and all kinds of wisdom that were put out by people. And uh, at the end of it, I found myself uh, quite confused. So I do not recommend anything that is up on this slide, actually. Um, <laughs> now, these three slides I have actually shared at IMA before, uh, maybe two or three years back. So if you were here then and it's a uh, repetition, uh, please forgive me. But I think. Uh, I have not been able to, you know, uh, embed it enough in the minds of people. So I always start uh, with, with the same three slides. Uh, but now I will show you something more new, more recent, uh, to, to try and convince you that what I'm saying is still current. Uh, next, please. This was the, this is from The Economist, um, as recently as uh, two months ago. And essentially what it says is, you know, first they teach you how to really create a successful business plan. And then they write another book that says, burn your business plan. Uh, so you just, you're like a dog chasing your own tail. Um, and you're very courageous in the process uh, because you learn so many things, you unlearn so many things, you apply them, you fail 90% of the time, still you manage to keep your job. This is courage and uncertainty um, in the corporate world. And finally, I want to share with you um, my last piece of uh, information on this. The next slide, please. Um, I come from a family where everyone went to Harvard Business School. You know, my father, my uncles, my brother, even my brother-in-law. I, I think without going to Harvard Business School, he could not have married my sister. <laughs> so he went there as well. I didn't go to Harvard Business School. Um, and they always tell me it's because, you know, Harvard Business School would not, would not take me. Um, and that is the motive behind uh, this, uh, this slide. At Harvard, one of the best known professors um, is uh, uh, a guy called Clayton Christensen. Professor Clayton Christensen is best known for his work uh, such as The Innovator's Dilemma. I'm sure many of you have read that book. Um, and uh, that has yet another theory on how you can fail 90% of the time. Uh, so uh, I want to show you now a very short video. It is a video uh, where you will hear uh, uh, Professor Christensen speak about Harvard Business School and business education. And uh, uh, he is trying to propound another theory now. It's called 
disruption 101. We live in disruptive times. So how can we have the courage and the wisdom uh, to succeed, to be competitive in these disruptive times? So in order to sell disruption 101, he needs you to be convinced that everything else that you know so far uh, is, uh, is not quite right. Uh, so let's listen for the next 33 seconds to Professor Clayton Christensen. The video, please. Why is success so difficult to sustain? If you look across the sweep of business history, most companies which at one point were widely regarded as unassailably successful, a decade or two later you find them in the middle of the pack and often at the bottom of the heap. And I reached the strangest conclusion uh, after having studied this for a number of years, which is that it's actually the principles of good management that we teach at the Harvard Business School that sow the seeds of every company's ultimate failure. It is, the, it is what we teach at the Harvard Business School that sow the seeds of every company's ultimate failure. Um, they, are, they are obviously a very open organization um, and, and they don't mind saying this about themselves. So, um, next slide please. So having uh, been a victim of all this, I've, I said to myself that management needs to have some principles. You know, it needs, there has to be some science in management um, that stands the test of time so that management can be repeatable. If you do the same thing again and again, even if in a different context, if the world around you has changed, if the competition has changed, if, you're, if something has changed inside of you, but you should be able to produce a positive result each time, as much as we expect any professional in his field to do so. And one of the principles that I found very useful for myself uh, at my company was this, that essentially do not serve a market, create your own market. Whether you are a marketing organization, where, whether you are an engineering organization, whether you are doing products or services, we all have two fundamental options as managers. We have the option to, to be a me too to try and take a slice out of an existing market that somebody else has created and effectively to run a commoditized business. Or we have the choice to differentiate ourselves, to do something different, not to be intuitive but to be contra-intuitive, to say to oneself that if there is a market out there for something and if I also try to participate and do so by aping the market leader. Well, if you ape the market leader, then in the end, even if you do well, you're still an ape. That doesn't change. So it's better to do something different, to do something that is in contrast to the market leader, to create your own market, to differentiate yourself. And as Rees and Trout tell us, not to try to sell, but to try to sup supply a reason to buy. And I think this, this strategy of not serving markets but creating their own markets is the reason why even in these uncertain times, some companies continue to do well. In the last two or three years, while we read about the pressures in the IT industry, for example, but we also read about companies like TCS and Cognizant that do very well. While we read about the debacle in the aviation industry, but we read about an indigo that just goes from strength to strength every year. And while we read about the difficulties of the auto industry, we have companies like Royal Enfield, and if I may say so, Bajaj and Mahindra, that do really, really well. So I think in the same uncertain external environment, we can find examples of success. And I think that success is based on a certain kind of courage. And specifically, that courage is the courage to differentiate, to create your own identity, to have the conviction to stick with that, and not to go with the tide, with the herd mentality of the time. Finally, I close with a quote of uh, Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. Next, please. 
Hippocrates said, I want to know more about the person that has a disease and less about the disease that a person has. He said, I don't want to know more and more and more about the problem. I want to know who is this person who has a problem. Because as I've explained here once before, two people breathing the same air do not both get swine flu. Two people eating at the same restaurant don't both get an upset stomach. Two people playing squash don't both hurt their lower back. The guy who falls sick or gets hurt is the guy who has a weakness inside of him. So the problem is not the virus outside or, or the food or something else. The real problem is the concept of susceptibility. Because he was susceptible, because his vitality was low, he fell prey to something. In the same way, as Hippocrates is trying to understand the susceptibility of the human being that makes him susceptible to a disease, I think our job is to understand what is susceptibility in my organization, what makes my organization susceptible, and to fix that susceptibility from inside by fixing our strategy, as some of these outstanding companies like TCS, Cognizant, Indigo have done. And if we do that with the courage to differentiate, then I think we can weather any uncertain times. So that is my message for this morning. Thank you once again for having me here. Thank you.